Senator Robert A. Taft of Ohio. Senator Taft speaks tonight from Washington as one of the Senate Republican leaders who have asked the Senate to approve the labor bill by the two-thirds majority necessary to override President Truman's veto. Senator Taft. On January 15th, the Senate began hearings on many bills designed to correct the abuses which have developed in the field of labor relations and brought about so many serious strikes in the last year. We heard witnesses from all sides, including many union officials, but had little help from them because while they admitted that abuses had occurred, they took the position that no legislation was necessary or desirable, but that it should all be left to the labor leaders themselves to settle. A bill was finally prepared by the Senate committee and approved by 11 of 13 members and fully debated in detail in the committee and on the floor. It was amended and then debated further in conference. Many provisions from the House bill were accepted, but no change made in the fundamental provisions of the Senate bill. Finally, the conference report was debated on the floor of the Senate, and the bill was sent to the President. A flood of false propaganda was let loose against the bill by the labor leaders who never wanted any legislation, and Washington has been flooded with delegations bringing all the pressure possible on Congress and the President. The President was away most of the time after you received the bill, including three or four days in Canada. And it was on Tuesday last that he told the press, according to the New York Times, that he had not yet read the bill in the form it passed both houses of Congress. I am going to study it for the next two days, he said. On Friday, after two days' study, he vetoed a bill which congressmen and senators had studied and worked over for five months. It is not surprising that his veto message contained so many errors and showed so clearly that he did not understand the bill. But he talked vaguely of some other labor legislation. He, of course, knew that the effect of a successful veto would be no legislation at all what the labor leaders had always wanted. The president's veto message on the labor bill came to the Senate about 1.30 Friday. It is not usual to debate veto messages, because the same bill has been extensively debated on its passage. But Senator Morse of Oregon, Senator Taylor of Idaho, and Senator Pepper of Florida, representing the labor opposition to the bill, proceeded to filibuster against a vote, presumably to give the labor union leaders more time to use high-pressure methods on senators. Washington and the galleries of the Senate have been flooded with labor, lobbyists, and special trains are being run from New York on Monday to bring the left-wingers down to overawe the Senate. But, of course, in America, these tactics have just the opposite effect, and I have no doubt now whatever of the passage Monday of the labor bill over the president's veto. A failure to pass the bill now would only confirm the labor leader's belief acquired during the past ten years that they are above the law and above governmental restraint. What was the reason that the people demand a labor bill and showed their desire so clearly in the last election. Undoubtedly, it was the large number of strikes, and even more, the injustice of so many existing laws, which seemed to place the actions of unions outside of both justice and law. We have seen arbitrary strikes, violence and mass picketing, coercion of employees who don't conform, boycotts which bankrupt innocent third parties, racketeering, including that which prevents farmers from delivering their own products to market. Originally, the employer had every advantage in dealing with his employees. Congress set out to redress that condition and passed the Clayton Act in 1914, the Norris LaGuardia Act in 1932, and the Wagner Act in 1935. The effect of these laws, together with administrative rulings and court decisions, was to shift the balance of power way over on to the other side, until the labor unions have recently had every advantage in collective bargaining, except against the very largest industrial companies, and their strikes have been encouraged and protected by law. In particular, they have had small concerns at their mercy. I quote what Mr. Justice Brandeis, who was a friend of labor, said regarding a legal condition of this kind. Quote, this practical immunity of the unions from legal liability is deemed by many labor leaders a great advantage. To me, it appears to be just the reverse. It tends to make officers and members reckless and lawless 
and thereby to alienate public sympathy and bring failure upon their efforts. It creates on the part of the employers also a bitter antagonism, not so much on account of lawless acts as from a deep-rooted sense of injustice, arising from the feeling that while the employer is subject to law, the union holds a position of legal irresponsibility. End of quote. Certainly, the labor leaders today have alienated public sympathy, and if they continue, they will bring failure upon their efforts. The purpose and effect of our bill is not to limit in any way the basic rights of unions to bargain collectively or to strike to secure better hours, wages, or working conditions, or limit in any way the fundamental right of workmen to organize and join unions and insist on the recognition of unions. These rights are unchanged, and we modified in no way the unfair labor practice provisions, which forbid employers from interfering with these rights. We did provide various unfair labor practices on the part of unions so that the law works both ways instead of one and unions no longer have special privileges. What does the bill do and why? First, it outlaws jurisdictional strikes, giving the National Labor Relations Board power to decide these inter-labor controversies which have tied up important work for months and even years. It outlaws a strike by one union when the NLRB has certified another union after an election. It outlaws secondary boycotts, which have grown by leaps and bounds. That is where one union refuses to handle the products made by a concern which does not have a contract with the same union. Such boycotts have completely destroyed numerous small businesses. They have barred all electrical equipment, for instance, from New York City construction unless made in New York City. They have raised prices and promoted monopoly. Second, it makes unions responsible in the courts for unlawful acts and for violation of their contracts, as if they were incorporated. It requires them to file financial reports with their members and full reports on their organization with the Secretary of Labor. Free collective bargaining, in our opinion, is the basis for all American labor policy but it can have no permanent effect unless both parties are responsible and carry out their contracts. This provision of the bill only recognizes that unions have grown up. Unions are big business today like any other corporation. Third, the bill makes it unlawful for labor unions to use their union funds in, in, in national elections for president or congress, just as corporations have long been forbidden to use their funds for that purpose. Why should union dues paid to support the union be used to defeat a candidate whom the member paying the dues may want to see elected? Just as corporations ought to keep out of politics and use their stockholders' money only for company business, so should unions apply their funds only to union business. Fourth, the bill provides an enlarged mediation service outside of the Department of Labor so that it may be and may be considered by employers to be absolutely fair and impartial and not an agency of the unions. Fifth, the bill provides that in the case of strike or lockouts covering a whole industry or a substantial part thereof and only if it endangers the national health or safety, the Attorney General on order of the President may obtain an injunction against the strike for 60 days to keep the industry going while further mediation efforts are made. If such efforts fail, an election is held. If the men still vote a strike for legal purposes, this bill does not further prohibit it. I myself do not believe that we can prohibit strikes for wages, hours, and working conditions unless we are prepared to have the government finally fix wages. If the government fixes wages, it must fix prices, and we soon have a complete regulation of our whole economy. If a strike should reach a point where it is finally a serious threat to the existence of the nation, like a general strike, special legislation to deal with a particular situation could be enacted, and it need not provide either for drafting the strikers into the army as President Truman proposed last year. Most of our bill is a comprehensive revision of the Wagner Act and a correction of many of the pro-labor rulings of the National Labor Relations Board which in the beginning years was completely prejudiced and disregarded every principle of justice. 
We have separated the prosecuting function of the board, now to be vested in the general counsel, from the judicial functions, to be vested in the board itself. The board can no longer be prosecutor, judge, and jury as it assumed to be in the earlier years. The board's actions are made subject also to a more extensive review by the courts. In general, we simply made the law work both ways. It is to be an unfair labor practice for unions to coerce men to join a union, just as employers may not coerce them the other way. Unions are required to bargain collectively, an injunction laid only on the employer today. Standby payments for men who aren't needed and don't work are finally forbidden. We have dealt with the abuses of the closed shop. The closed shop is not sacred or essential to unionism. It has been forbidden for years by the Railroad Labor Act. It is contrary to the spirit of the Wagner Act, which forbids an employer to discriminate against a man because he is or is not a union member. And a special proviso in that act was necessary to make the closed shop legal. We have taken out that proviso, but we do permit a union shop agreement where every new employee may be required to join the union in 30 days. But we provide further that if the union won't admit him on his application at a reasonable admission fee, the employer need not fire him. Or if a union expels a man for any reason other than non-payment of dues, the employer need not fire him. In short, any union which wants to abolish the open shop must be an open union. We had many cases where men were fired from their union because they offered or offended or antagonized the union leaders. Once because a man testified under oath that he saw a shop steward assault a foreman and where they lost their jobs and perhaps their trade for good. The bill does not restore the right of any private person to enjoin a strike. Only the government and the interest of all the people can secure such an injunction and only in the case of jurisdictional strikes and secondary boycotts and nationwide strikes endangering the national health or safety. The bill does not prohibit any ordinary strike for justifiable purposes or even require a strike vote. The bill does not regulate the internal affairs of unions, as many think it should. It does not authorize any employer to do anything now forbidden to him or interfere with the union's right to recognition unless the assurance of the right to free speech guaranteed by the First Amendment is a modification. To call the bill a slave labor bill is simply false propaganda to prevent any labor legislation whatever. That is the goal of the labor union leaders now apparently accepted by the president. This bill, which will become law tomorrow, is a correction of existing laws made necessary by the abuses which those laws have created. It is confined to matters which the testimony shows to be abuses against the public, against employers, and against individual workmen. Of course, the correction of those abuses will reduce the power of certain labor union officers, and that power should be reduced. If in collective bargaining either side has power to secure unreasonable demands, the leaders of that side will soon make those demands. Existing laws have given labor leaders the whole advantage, particularly in dealing with smaller employers. We have tried here to redress the balance without going too far so that the power of both sides is substantially equal. Only thus can we hope for success in free collective bargaining. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard a discussion by Senator Robert A. Taft, Republican of Ohio, concerning the Taft-Hartley labor bill, which the Senate will vote on tomorrow afternoon. Senator Taft appeared tonight to answer the criticisms of the labor bill made by President Truman when the president vetoed the measure last Friday. Senator Taft spoke tonight from Washington.